I'm Dr. Robin Williams, and for today's tour, we're going to explore the historic Savannah waterfront, which has been a place of trade and commerce since the city's founding. As one of the best preserved waterfronts anywhere in America, it provides a glimpse of what most older ports once looked like with their utilitarian warehouses and crude cobblestone pavement. But in Savannah, the shape of the river, and especially the bluff or cliff of sand that drops 40 feet down to the river's edge resulted in a fascinating combination of buildings, walls, bridges, and ramps that is a cultural landscape and built environment unique in the world. So the U.S. Custom House here on Bay Street opposite City Hall was an essential part of the trade network system. For the United States government, Custom houses like these in the major seaports on the East Coast were the major source of revenue for the U.S. government in the 19th century. The Custom House is the oldest federal building in Georgia and continues to serve the purpose for which it was designed, to collect duties on shipping entering the Savannah port. The building was designed by New York architect John Norris in 1848 and completed in 1852. It is a great example of Greek Revival architecture with its abstract simplicity, general lack of ornament, and classical emphasis on symmetry, but with a Roman-style staircase typical of government architecture. It is built out of solid granite, which was imported from Quincy, Massachusetts, because Georgia granite wasn't yet available. Its austere design suggests the sober seriousness of collecting custom duties. The most significant Greek Revival feature within John Norris's design is the grand hexastyle, or six-column portico, with its distinctive Tower of the Winds order. That was found on a single building in Athens. It's unusual because at the top, if we look up, we can see that these capitals look like Corinthian columns. Now, a historic plaque near the building says that these are tobacco leaves, and that's utter nonsense. These are ancient Greek acanthus leaves with these reeds or palm fronds above. A unique combination that was only found in this order at the Tower of the Winds in Athens. And as we look down, you'll notice there are no joints in the shaft of the columns because these are monolithic once again. The other unique aspect of these columns is at the bottom, we can see that there are no bases on these columns. The shaft sits directly onto the platform of the portico. So it's a baseless, fluted Corinthian order. As I say, only found on one building in the ancient world. And because it was in ancient Athens, it was discovered in the 18th century, this order was kind of obscure. So if you were an architect who really wanted to show off your ancient Greek knowledge, in using the Greek Revival, you use this order. And here in Savannah, there are probably three or four buildings that make use of it because architects were eager to show that they knew their Greek Revival stuff. So the portico involves these monolithic granite columns. Monolithic meaning they're made out of a single piece of granite, each weighing approximately 30 tons. As I said, this building was built like a tank, and for good reason, because it collected money from the revenue of duties paid by incoming ships, like trade duties. We've had in the news over the past year or so a trade war with China where customs duties and tariffs and embargoes are the kind of vocabulary we're used to hearing in the news related to modern trade, but this isn't. These are old tools used between countries. And for the U.S. government, the revenue generated by tariffs was critical to the running of the government, as I've mentioned. So money was collected and kept in this building. So the building had to be strong. So in addition to being built out of granite, it has these heavy iron doors. And as we go a little closer, we can hear that they're made of heavy metal. These doors are not the only pieces of metal on the building. In fact, the building has metal throughout as a structural material to help with the building being fireproof. 
So around 1850, the use of iron in construction in America was in its infancy. So this is one of the oldest buildings in the country to have the use of iron. It has cast iron beams in the basement and wrought iron beams at the first, at this main floor level above the ceiling of the side wings. And on the roof, the whole roof is corrugated like a ridge and furrow field of plates of heavy iron. The roof is a strong, thick metal roof. So if you go to the attic, as I've done once, and look at the underside of the roof, you're seeing the same metal that you can see from the outside. And it's the oldest of its kind in the country. Upon entering the custom house, we can see the classical formality we'd expect of a civic building. But its surprising simplicity and lack of ornament are typical of the Greek revival. The concern for solid, fireproof construction is amply evident here, with the stone floor involving massive slabs of granite and the bulky stone piers that carry the elliptical stone arches. The only obvious Greek Revival decorative detail is the distinctive door frame that we can see to the right with its slanted and tapering sides and pointed lintel. Well, let's go a little closer to the stairs and see that it, the staircase rises up to a central landing and then splits into flights that curve back towards the second floor, revealing underneath a true feat of stone masonry. Each stair is a single block of granite cut as a wedge that widens as it approaches the walls and twists with a steeper curve by the railing and a more gentle curve by the wall. In effect, each stair block is like an arch voussoir laid on its side, but twisted. As we go up the stairs to the landing, we can see the half dome above, a more Roman feature reminding the visitor that this is a public building. From the second floor, we can see easily the curving elegant walls of the staircase that reflect the long-standing fascination with geometry within the broader neoclassical tradition to which the Greek revival belonged. The simplicity of the first floor lobby carries into the second floor where stone piers and elliptical arches continue to support the central section of the interior while the wings, the parts of the building left and right of the portico and the lobby spaces are held up by cast iron beams in the basement and wrought iron beams above the first floor. Let's go back outside to continue our exploration of the waterfront. From the portico of the Custom House, we get a great view of City Hall, and we can also see the warehouses across Bay Street that line the waterfront that we'll be visiting today. We have to descend this staircase beside City Hall, which takes us down to the level of the more working class industrial areas of the waterfront. And we can see up ahead the air conditioners and, and utilitarian aspects of the lower parts of the warehouses. The stone wall on the left is the base of City Hall. And as we emerge from the staircase, we are here down, halfway down the ramp that descends from Drayton Street to the uh, base of City Hall and down to River Street. Here we can see the four storage vaults in the wall holding back the bluff. And one of the defining characteristics of the Savannah waterfront, which just really makes it a unique urban configuration, is how the waterfront has this 40-foot change of grade from the flat Bay Street level down to the river. And the warehouses are built at the bottom of the hill, at the base of the bluff, historically, and the city is at the top of the bluff. And the evolution through time of how did this change of grade get negotiated? Initially, the streets just went straight over the edge of the bluff down to the water, but over time, and they were just like a sandy slope. But over time, starting in the early 19th century, they started stabilizing it with brick walls and stone walls and cobblestone pavement and bridging from that level of Bay Street into the warehouses with a whole variety of different kinds of metal bridges and wooden bridges. And behind me here are two different examples. The closer one is an example of what we call a box truss. It's just a simple straight truss with a crisscross pattern 
and it's reinforced underneath with uh, X braces. And so this is similar to what you see for railway bridges, a straight box truss. And then beyond it is a very shallow but nonetheless arched truss. So it gains its strength from being in an arch configuration. All along the edge of the bluff, the cliff of sand that defines the edge of the waterfront, are a series of walls that holds back the dirt on the north side of Bay Street. And as we go along, we're gonna see a variety of wall structures. And among the oldest on the waterfront are these brick walls and arched chambers that were erected in the 1840s when an architect named Husky approached the city and requested permission to build these vaulted chambers as kind of warehousing that takes advantage of the, the bluff and not only holds back the bluff, but allows for the parkland above, right beside City Hall, to be on top of these chambers. And we're going to see this as we go along, these different insertions into the walls where basically it was dead space, so why not use it for extra storage? So let's go inside and see what these chambers are like. As we enter these storage chambers, we'll notice something come into view. And by now you should know what kind of ceiling this is. This is a segmental barrel vault. And you can probably tell from the acoustics that this is a really cool space. It also is a little damp. Looking back towards the arched entrance, we can see that each one would have had gates on the, on the arches, as well as a window flanking it. And this pair has a doorway running between them. Each chamber gets smaller as we climb the hill. So the bit, we're in the lowest, biggest chamber, and as we pass through this little doorway here, we're going to, which is dripping, so hopefully you may avoid getting wet here. Here we are in the next chamber, which is a little bit shorter, likewise segmentally barrel vaulted, and this one has an even clearer skylight off the back end. And these are lurking right behind the benches that sit, you can just make out maybe, um, that there are benches up on Bay Street. And if you, if you have a keen eye and look behind the benches, you'll see, you'll see these openings. These are essentially storage units that could be rented by different companies or different individuals. And they reflect an essential part of the waterfront experience of, of trade, which is warehousing. And in fact, a focus, a major focus of today's tour will be the issue of warehousing. Third chamber up from City Hall, which is still a little bit shorter, also retains more of its original stucco, and you can see it's a much cleaner interior environment. So it's not such a stretch to imagine these as storage chambers. So it begs the question, what was stored in here? And the city has done archeology span in a few of the chambers to see if there's any evidence of whether or not they were used for, for example, as slave pens. And there's a, a local suspicion by some, some historians that these in fact were for the storage of slaves, but there's no hard evidence of that. You can't talk about trade and the Savannah waterfront before the Civil War without addressing the issue of slavery. Inevitably, there were slaves in Savannah that were an essential part of the Southern economy. Slaves worked in the warehouses, they worked in private residences, they worked in plantations outside the city. So they were the, and they helped build the city in fact. It's entirely conceivable that these chambers were built with the assistance of slave labor. They were not just in the farmer plantations, but there were skilled slaves who were blacksmiths and bricklayers and stonemasons and carpenters. So we forget just what a contribution they made to the built environment of the South, let alone Savannah. Another defining characteristic of the Savannah waterfront is the cobblestone pavement. And these cobblestones are from all over the world and they arrived here as ship ballast, meaning the stones that help, carry, help keep a ship bottom heavy so it doesn't blow over in, when it's out at sea. And so these stones are literally from around the world. They would have been picked up in different ports and transferred from ship to ship 
and eventually made their way to Savannah where they were unloaded and replaced with heavy cargoes of cotton or other materials. And so these cobblestones were left behind and piled up on the wharfs. So the cobblestones are essentially an industrial pavement. And we're gonna see at the top of the hill how it shifts to brick. And so the cobblestone is to pavement what say the air conditioners and unornamented aspects of these warehouses are to the architecture. In other words, this is essentially a kind of a working class informal pavement. And at the top of the hill, we'll see uh, vitrified brick, which is a much more dressed up pavement. One of the consequences of Savannah's waterfront being divided by a steep bluff is that the waterfront essentially has two worlds. The elegant, dressed up level of Bay Street from those bridges above where we have City Hall and the upper halves of the warehouses and the working utilitarian half of the waterfront through which the cobblestone ramps descend. And what's really intriguing is how the, there was a recognition of this boundary. So as we reach the top of the ramp at the Bay Street level, the pavement actually changes from the rudimentary and crude cobblestones to the much more refined and smooth red vitrified brick, the same brick that lines Jones Street. So as we walk across the brick roadway here, we can see the dressed up warehouses like these Italianate white ones on the right and the red brick and iron ones beyond by the palm tree and in the middle is the Cotton Exchange, one of the great landmarks of the Savannah waterfront. The brokers, or factors as they're known, the people who sell, buy and sell the cotton, had offices in these warehouses at the level of Bay Street, in the upper half of the warehouses, and their offices are all dressed up facing uh, Bay Street. They lobbied City Hall and said, we need room for an exchange where we can set a market price and the problem was that there were no vacant sites left on the waterfront. So they petitioned City Hall and asked if they could build their exchange over top of one of the ramps. And the city said, fine, you can build it over Drayton Ramp, as long as you leave Drayton Street accessible underneath, which we'll see in a few minutes. Now the building that you see that was erected was designed by a Boston architect named William Preston, who had a Savannah connection through one of his former MIT classmates, William Baldwin. Baldwin contacted Preston and said, hey, come design this building. And so it's designed in a beautiful Queen Anne style. So this is more of the commercial architectural version of Queen Anne, red brick, a lot of terracotta ornament, very steep pediment up at the top, stubby classical columns. And at the top, you can see the inscription, Savannah Cotton Exchange, and over the facade are cotton details and to the far left you can see right over here and to the far right right there are these globes that reflect the global scope of trade that comes through the Savannah waterfront. Extending both east and west of the Cotton Exchange are long rows of warehouses. Here we see the Cotton Factors offices on the upper two stories and below here are four stories of warehousing that are accessible via the various levels of the terrace lanes that we're about to see and then accessible from River Street itself. So from the Cotton Exchange, which you can see just at the top of the uh, frame, we're going to descend these historic steps, which we'll use at our own risk. And as we go down, we can see we're entering into a much less elegant and much more utilitarian and rugged environment where there's no effort to dress anything up with, with uh, fancy details. But as we look straight forward, there is Drayton Street extending straight ahead under the foundations of the Cotton Exchange. So the Cotton Exchange has uh, sits on that brick wall, these rows of cast iron columns, and that brick wall. And over time, a kind of basement was inserted in amongst those columns, but essentially the whole building is resting on those columns. But it's still possible to drive down here. 
and it makes for an interesting experience. So let's explore the details of this subterranean area. We can see that the hill rises up to a lower level lane that you can see just here, and then an upper level terrace or lane, each with its own cars, and the bridge is above connecting at two different stories. So we have a bridge connecting at this level and bridges connecting at this upper level. And from here we can see the retaining walls of stone and brick and more stone. A kind of textbook of different masonry patterns. So in front of me here are, is basically a random masonry of irregular stones laid in an irregular random pattern. All of these stones, by the way, coming over as ballast, just like the cobblestones. The walls that look like this, with the cut masonry in, with a lot of precision, so not only are they curving, they're sloping, and the individual blocks of stone are nested together with incredible precision. In fact, we can see here a pattern that almost looks like a modern piece of art with the different blocks and different patterns, like a Mondrian piece. These walls were made by an Irish stonemason immigrant named Michael Cash. Now, how do we know this? Well, he thought so highly of his work, and the city also thought highly of it, that he signed his walls. So along the way, we'll, I'll show you one of those plaques where Michael Cash has signed them. Plus, there are lots of records that indicate he did this in the 1850s and 60s as a part of an effort to improve the retention of the bluff. But the precision and uh, craftsmanship that he brought was uh, second to none. It was really first-rate craftsmanship. Things we're going to see as we move our way along the waterfront is how the walls are like a record of shipments of stone. So for example, the upper part of this wall has a combination of black volcanic stone and white limestone interspersed, but there's a clear boundary where it then shifts to a kind of gray limestone below with the odd piece of volcanic stone. But what you can say about this is that these are two different loads of stone. Presumably it came in on different ships. And as the stones became available, Cash would use them. Move along Factor's Walk, we'll see all sorts of staircases, shifts in the wall plane, different kinds of bridges from wood and iron and, and different bridge building technology. and. Just to reinforce that point, if we look at the building here, we can see that the upper parts are incredibly ornate and the lower parts are incredibly plain and uh, utilitarian. As we saw at the beginning of the tour over by City Hall, the, where the Klusky vaults were carved into the hillside, here we see a vestige of little storage compartments that have since been filled in with brickwork but the patterns of doorways with their stone lintels reveals uh, the intensity of trade that was on this waterfront where every little square inch was used for storage wherever they could put it. Several points on the waterfront, there are these steep staircases with slate steps, which are jokingly referred to in Savannah as the stone stairs of death. So follow me as we traipse up these steep stairs. And we've re-emerged now back at the Bay Street level, where we can once again see the more elegant side of the waterfront. The oldest warehouse on the eastern half of the waterfront is the stepped warehouse behind me with its distinctive crow-stepped uh, side gable and steep roofs. All the warehouses we've seen before this have had flat roofs and they're all from the 1850s but this one's from the 18 teens or 1820s and you can see that it's not as dressed up so as the warehouses grew through time they got a little more self-conscious and the factors dressed up their offices but this one shows a kind of utilitarian character that reflects its early construction along the waterfront a series of bridges span the ramps so this is abercorn ramp and we'll be crossing this bridge momentarily but this break in the waterfront gives us a vantage point to be able to see down to not only that old warehouse 
but the shift of grade down to the river and the waterfront down below. You may be wondering about those big X's on the side of this old warehouse. And those are a good example of what we've seen previously and what you should recognize as earthquake bolts. So these are the end flanges. And the fact that these X's are just sort of haphazardly oriented is further evidence of just how utilitarian this structure was. There was no real precision or care given to how these were done. And a rod extends all the way through this warehouse and has its companion at the other end of the warehouse over there where you see the far gable. The more complex and grand warehouses is this one that extends over to Lincoln Ramp. And you can see that although it's been painted white in the western part, it comprises multiple bays with a central section that rises up in a gable. What is even more extraordinary is as we approach it, we can see that the building actually bends in the middle. From here, I think you can see how the roof line of this white section in the foreground is not parallel to that farther section that extends out towards the right. These warehouses are essentially following the contour of the waterfront as it undulates past. And so this is a factor that we'll see even more vividly from the lower part of the waterfront that this is essentially what we call organic urbanism. It's following the natural contours and topography of the land, as opposed to the orthogonal grid that defines so much of the city, especially downtown. The waterfront is very haphazard and natural and irregular. Unusual bridge forms used on the Savannah waterfront are these very delicate, lightweight bridges that use what's called a bowstring truss. And from here you can see a rod coming along here and right there is a turnbuckle that connects the two rods and another rod here and these turnbuckles can be turned and pull the rods together essentially bringing the bow taut like a bowstring and the tautness of those rods will force the bridge to basically form a very subtle arch. The tighter those rods, the stronger the bridge. And although very lightweight, and these are bridges from the late 19th century, they're still incredibly strong. The wooden decking has to be replaced periodically. As you can see, it's relatively new looking, but the ironwork is quite old and holding its own just fine. As we cross over the bridge that spans the Lincoln Ramp, we can look down and see the vast field of cobblestones, the stone walls erected by Michael Cash, and we get a sense of this uh, almost primitive landscape that feels like old fortress walls. In fact, a lot of these stones probably came from demolished buildings and fortresses in other parts of the world and were used as cargo, as ballast to end up in Savannah. And then you pan up and suddenly there's the city in all of its geometric regularity and orderliness with this irregular waterfront down below. At the foot of every ramp, the designers of the waterfront renewal project back in the 1970s put some kind of culminating object, be it a sculpture, a little tugboat model, uh, a fountain, or in this case, three magnolia trees that close the view essentially and terminate the experience of coming down the ramp and seeing the waterfront and sort of forming a kind of transition and an exclamation point, as it were, to the urban experience of descending down to the waterfront. As we move farther east along the Savannah waterfront, we can see that the warehouses progressively get a bit shorter, they're simpler, and they also bend more dramatically as they follow the contour of the river, illustrating what we might call this organic urbanism of how the buildings and the ramps respond to the topography as opposed to the grid of the city across Bay Street. Back towards Bay Street at Lincoln, we can see how there is this open expanse of green defined along its edge by Rossiter Street, which is a red vitrified brick roadway, once again using a dressed up material and lined by elegant granite curbs. And the green space in the middle here 
is what we call the Strand. So let's learn more about it because it has its own fascinating history. The Strand, now called Emmett Park, is this green expanse between Bay Street, that straight northern edge of this urban plan of Savannah, and the irregular top of the bluff that bridges over to the warehouses. And this is one of the most extraordinary aspects of Savannah's waterfront. It really has nothing to do with trade, but rather it was a vestigial space, a leftover space that the urban fathers of Savannah over the, over the many decades in the history of the city have decided not to turn into warehousing, except at the very western end of the waterfront, over by Barnard, where one can find Jerry's Antiques Shop. That is the one exception to this band of green that, that essentially negotiates the transition from the city to the waterfront. And this is perhaps the most unique aspect here, beyond the transition down to the wall, the bluff itself and all the bridges and lanes that we've seen, is the fact that there's this long ribbon of green populated by multiple monuments. You can just see behind me the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. There are probably a dozen monuments in the Strand area along the waterfront, more than in any of the squares. And the fact that there are monuments here tells us that this is formalized green space. And it helps account for why the buildings, that the upper parts of the buildings, are dressed up. So imagine this level being essentially like from my waist up, dressed up with a suit and tie. But imagine the area below Bay Street if I had ripped up blue jeans on and were utilitarian and rough and rugged. So essentially the level of the bridges represents the waist of the waterfront, dressed up above Bay Street, very utilitarian below and you can see as we go along this sense of formality actually has a very long history. We are standing on the sidewalk along the north side of Bay Street and the sidewalk is flanked by rows of live oaks that have stood here since the late 19th century but they're on the site of trees, chinaberry trees, that were planted here in the late 18th century, that is the late 1700s, as a kind of promenade and in Europe, we would call this an alley, the kind of rows of trees that might line a driveway. And in Europe, these would be reserved for the elite to go for their, uh, in their carriages or on horseback and go out for a stroll. But here in Savannah, it was, at least for the white population, a place where they could walk along under the shade of the trees and it gives us a clue, the emphasis placed by the city of Savannah on the uh, importance of trees, that from a very early date, from the late, night, late 18th century, Savannah was doing what other, most other cities hadn't even thought of and wouldn't do for another century, and that is planting formal rows of trees. I believe this, is, this, this pair of rows along here, at least the ones that were here before, is the first time in American City that rows of trees were planted along the side of a roadway. A tradition, of course, that becomes very, very common in America and throughout Savannah. At the very east end of the Strand is this remarkable piece of urban infrastructure known as the Old Harbor Light, which suggests it's like an old lighthouse, but actually what it really is is a range light. It was one of two lights that line up that assist with navigation. It's like those lights that line up at the end of a runway today that planes use to find their path towards a runway. Or if you're out navigating as, a, as someone in a boat, you may notice on different waterways that there are pairs of, of range markers. So this would have had a companion in the distance at the tip of Fig Island. And what these were for was to help ships navigate the Savannah River starting in 1858 when this was erected, the, the navigation on the river was getting pretty desperate because almost a hundred years earlier during the American revolutions in the 1770s, the British scuttled ships, meaning they purposely sunk ships in the Savannah River to stop the French Navy from coming in. Well, those ships were still causing a nuisance for shipping even as late as 1858 at which point, even though they had helped clear a channel 
to help ships find their way, basically to thread the needle up the Savannah River, they would farther out the Savannah River look for these two lights and use them and of course all the trees around us here and on the end of the island. So they would use those two lights to line up their path to move through the river. Harbor light is made out of cast iron and was probably not a mass-produced item but rather employed decorative features from other pieces of urban infrastructure and the fact that this harbor light is dressed up in such an elaborate manner is another sign of just how important, how formal is the Bay Street level of this public space in contrast to the utility and uh, simplicity of everything below the level of, of Bay Street. From the top of the bluff at the east end of the waterfront, we can see East Broad Ramp below and the eastern edge of the waterfront park, not far from the Waving Girl. But most importantly, we can see how the river, as it goes towards the ocean, curls to the north towards those domes, forming the eastern half of the crescent or curve that ultimately shaped the Savannah waterfront. You can see the river passing into the distance, and that curvature is where the, uh, the ships would come from the Atlantic, hook that corner, and line up the, uh, the two um, range lights to navigate their way uh, up that section of the river. From the harbor light, and looking back across the length of the strand, we can see just how extensive and important as a piece of green space this area is. By the way, these anchors are historic ship's anchors that have been found in the Savannah River that have been salvaged and brought up here to be part of a kind of nautical museum. And in the foreground here we can see one of the many monuments that dot this waterfront area. Using cast iron railing that lines the very end of this part of the waterfront is actually salvaged from a mansion over at MLK and Oglethorpe Avenue where the new Cultural Arts Center is be has been erected. This is part of the old Wetter House, which was torn down around 1950 for a parking lot to serve a used car lot. So at least there was the mentality to save this great ironwork and repurpose it and further dress up this end of the waterfront. If we descend the East Broad ramp, we can see these walls erected by Michael Cash and as we pan along and look at them, we can see these enormous blocks of stone, and many of which were probably from fortifications or major public buildings in Europe. And that, because all over Europe in the mid-19th mid century, fortifications, walls are being torn down and re opening up the cities, such as for the Vienna Ringstrasse and in Paris and London, walls were coming down. And so this gave, you know, what happened to all that stonework? Well, some of it may have ended up on ships. So where this came from, we don't know, but clearly these are repurposed old pieces of masonry. And as we walk along, we can see the wall changing its character. And so just over here, we can see at the base of the wall, a patch of very light colored uh, soft sandstone that's eroding actually quite a bit. And that's another example of one of those uh, ship loads that is quite marked in, the, in how it appears in this wall. One of the tallest and most elaborate sections of all the walls that Michael Cash erected is this at the east end facing the East Broad Ramp. And here we can see this amazing curvature of how the um, bottom of the wall forms a kind of crescent where the steps are actually carved into the wall. And the way he does that is by making a reverse curve. So when you come here, you can see that the base of the stairs, it curves in. And as we look up, we can see that we have this convex curve going to the left and a concave curve coming to the right and then going back to a convex. This is amazing stonework and illustrates the remarkable skill of Michael Cash. And in fact, just up to the right here is one of the plaques 
that says completed 1853, although it doesn't show Michael Cash's name. There are others that do, but this gives us a sense of when this was done. So this is, this is really stunning stonework that uh, reflects the investment in civic infrastructure and the expectation of the quality that is still holding up. And sadly, those stairs are now off limits because the city had to reinforce this wall with these big bolts that are anchored into the hillside. But uh, the steps themselves are no longer permitted. They were recently closed off. Below that wall is one of the few sections of cobblestones that remains at the level of Factors Walk. And as we walk along on these cobblestones, we can see that some of them are absolutely huge. And these stones are from all over the place. And to give a sense of just how big they are, I'll put my foot in, in the picture. And one can see that these are enormous cobblestones. Strategy for holding back the wall and a vestige of a former warehouse that stood here are these curving walls that essentially are like arches laid on their side that give this wall extra support and effectively these points buttress the wall. So this is the back wall of a warehouse that would have risen up and had the lane which is just above here uh, serving as its back door and below at my feet level is the river level. So here we have some ruins of a warehouse that burned down at some point in the 20th century and instead of replacing it this area has been turned into parkland. The Waving Girl Monument was the center of a recent uh, debate publicly over whether or not she should be moved, the monument should be moved, to the west end of the waterfront to serve as an ornament as part of the Plant Riverside development. As important as that development is though, this monument has stood here anchoring this green space which uh, used to be wharves of privately owned warehouses that the city acquired as those warehouses disappeared at the very eastern end of the waterfront. They turned it into parkland. Now the monument itself is to Florence Martius who was symbolic of, I guess you could say, the, the faithful love interest, spouse, girlfriend of sailors. And the dog of course is a symbol of fidelity and commitment. And so reputation goes that she stood out on Cockspur Island by Fort Pulaski, waving a towel or a flag at every passing ship, waiting for her beloved to come back to Savannah. Well, sadly, he never came back, and she for decades apparently waved to every passing ship and eventually was commemorated with this monument that, for the time being at least, remains anchored to the eastern end of the waterfront. And just beyond her, we can see the Olympic flame, a reminder that Savannah was a participant in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics with all the yachting events taking place out of Savannah. All along the north side of River Street, historically, were temporary wooden structures or open-sided wooden sheds that would have sheltered the cargo of cotton and other materials from the elements. So these structures that you see behind me are not historic. They're, they were erected within the last 20 years to serve for the tourist industry to provide uh, souvenir sellers a place to sell their wares and they're closed up now mainly because the waterfront is basically abandoned as a result of the coronavirus which allows it to be quite quiet which is good for shooting these videos but it doesn't give a sense of the hustle and bustle of the normal waterfront. But these sheds, uh, as you can see, are closed up and so these panels could be removed and open them all four sides to be open-sided sheds and these kind of structures would have been all the way along the north side of River Street. This parking lot that I'm standing in beside the Crab Shack is one of the few pieces of the Savannah waterfront that's still privately owned. But it reminds us that the whole waterfront, except where the streets came down, was once all in private hands. At the foot of Abercorn Ramp is one of the few remaining historic pieces of wharf infrastructure. The brick walls that would have supported the edges of the old wharfs or docks. And it, and 
can see that the original line of the waterfront didn't extend out nearly so far into the river as Rusakis Plaza does. And if you can see uh, not only the brick, the Savannah Gray brick, but there is a sewer inlet or outlet rather that would have drained sewage from the city. And then over more behind me on this side, you can see the extension of Rusakis Plaza and the concrete supports of all of this that make it possible basically reclaimed land all of Versailles Plaza standing on a reinforced concrete bridging structure. In contrast to the uh, city above where everything is lined up and orthogonal in a grid the waterfront here is organic with undulating streets and none of the buildings lining up with each other. The Cotton Exchange, which was so grand looking on the south side, here you can see is very, very plain indeed. And in fact, we can see that passage moving through, that roadway coming out. We saw it from the other side. And as we rise up, we can see the Cotton Exchange in terms of the big arched window up there and if you've got really keen eyes, we can make out the word cotton up there at the top of the round window because that two-story, that section right there is the trading hall of the original building and corresponds to the, that balcony in fact, corresponds to the ground level at Bay Street. From this side, it, you'd almost, you could walk by this building and not even notice that it was cotton exchange. The pavement on River Street is what we call Belgian block, and it is solid granite blocks cut into approximate rectangular brick-like shapes. And these blocks are very typical of industrial areas in American cities. So major seaports like New York and New Orleans and San Francisco would have had these blocks. In fact, in New York, they probably have more miles of streets that are still Belgian block than any other city in the country. But Savannah has a long stretch of them along River Street and in the middle of which are the tracks from this old freight line. Beginning in the 1930s, the port facilities that occupied these historic warehouses moved upriver to the modern port where it is today, which left these old warehouses abandoned and vulnerable to demolition. In fact, there were proposals to tear them down and replace them with parking garages as part of the effort to provide facilities for people to come into downtown. But fortunately, preservationists prevailed in saving almost all of them. And in the 1970s, the whole waterfront area, which was dirty and disused and probably very dangerous, became the focus of one of the nation's first waterfront renewals part of the larger campaign at Urban Renewal to improve urban spaces using federal funds. And this effort was led by Mayor Rusakis, and in his name, this is called Rusakis Plaza. And from 1975 to 1977, the whole waterfront was redesigned with these public plazas and some parking and event spaces that provided a very beautiful and has been remarkably successful waterfront renewal and in fact it continues to excel as a place not just for tourists but for locals to come and stroll on beautiful days like today. The African American Monument sitting at the foot of Bull Street Ramp by City Hall was installed in 2002 and designed by sculptor Dorothy Spradley. It was 10 years in the making and it is the first monument in the city's history to commemorate the long tradition of African Americans who have been a strong and substantial part of the Savannah community. It shows modern African Americans in their modern attire, but at their feet, if we go closer, we can see at their feet are chains that represent the emancipation of Africans from the bondage of slavery. We cannot talk about Savannah Waterfront without talking about the elephant in the room, and that is the Hyatt Hotel that dominates the block immediately west of City Hall. You're probably wondering, how is it possible that such a gargantuan hotel could have been allowed to occupy such a prominent site on the Savannah waterfront? Well, the reality is in the 1960s, a developer acquired this block, and strategically so, because this was the only block of warehouses that bridged over River Street, which established a precedent on that block and that block alone of whatever occupied it being allowed to bridge over. 
The developer wanted to erect a 30-story building. The preservationists and some locals were opposed to this. The city, of course, this is in the late 60s, was just eager to get any life down to the waterfront. And so, you know, you have your classic battle between investment and development versus preservation and trying to keep things from getting where the development ultimately destroys the thing it's trying to help preserve. Finally, it was decided that the height of the Hyatt would be no taller than the main body of City Hall, so capping it at roughly about 10 stories from River Street. And although it's huge, it could have been a much more gargantuan presence. But looking at it from a positive note, it has been a very successful hotel and was probably one of the catalysts that helped reinvigorate the waterfront area. Set in the pavement right in front of the Hyatt is this disc of stone which indicates one of the most historic moments in Georgia history. The place where Oglethorpe came ashore in February 1733 and began the history of Savannah. The buildings west of the Hyatt, the west end of the waterfront, continue that pattern of organically following the curvature of the river. And if you look at the tracks in the Belgian block pavement of River Street, you can see them curving into the distance, as do the warehouses. In the foreground, we have an infill building that follows the line of the historic warehouses, but rises a little taller in order to provide some transition to the massive Hyatt just to the east. This is the Bohemian Hotel, erected in 2009 by local hotelier Richard Kessler, who is also the developer of the enormous Plant Riverside project that we'll see at the end of the tour. Just west of the Hyatt, we can see the Globe, which is the World War II memorial, installed in 2010. Designed by local architect Eric Meyerhoff, the monument commemorates veterans with the split hemispheres representing the two major theaters of conflict during the war. The Atlantic, with Europe and Africa, on the right, and the Pacific with Asia on the left, and with the gap in between providing a space for the names of Savannah's war dead. Like the warehouses on the east end of the waterfront, those on the west rise five or six stories tall, whereas there are only two stories uh, facing Bay Street, and on their north face, facing the river, once again, they're very plain. Here we're looking at the north side of what's today the Cotton Sale Hotel, and just to the west of it is the oldest warehouse surviving on the waterfront where we can see the construction of the whole building is out of ship ballast stone as well as some infill patches of brick. It has a steep sloping roof, typical of early warehouses. And then farther to the uh, west, we see the Plant Riverside Hotel Complex. Anchoring the west end of the Savannah waterfront is the former Savannah Power Company Riverside Station, erected in 1912 and expanded several times before being decommissioned in 2005. It is currently being converted and expanded into an ambitious hotel and retail complex called Plant Riverside by local hotelier Richard Kessler and is set to open in the near future. The project is a wonderful example of adaptive reuse of giving new life and a new function to an abandoned or defunct building. As we see this immense ship coming into port in Savannah, we're reminded by how Savannah has become one of the fastest growing ports in the world and in fact is fourth largest container port in North America. And so with this look to the future and the rapid growth of the Savannah port, we're going to conclude today's tour of Savannah's historic waterfront and reflect on how it went from being uh, just small warehouses at the foot of a bluff to now one of the great ports in the world.